Hello students, this is Professor Johnson speaking from my home and I am interested to share with you a little enrichment resource, a, a small PowerPoint that I've put together on topics that go right with our next reading assignment, which is chapter six in the textbook. So I want to talk for a few minutes about the history of the telescope. Where did they come from? How did they get invented? What do we do with them? What's happening with telescopes right now? As uh, we move forward with this, I would just like to uh, point out that a lot of good astronomy was done before there were telescopes. This is a famous uh, picture of the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. Uh, he's using a giant observing instrument called a mural quadrant. It doesn't have lenses, doesn't have any optics. It simply had a sighting device and uh, a uh, very carefully calibrated angular scale. And so Tycho and before him other astronomers simply made observations of the positions of the stars and planets. Uh, you could do quite a lot of good with just that information. Uh, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion were derived entirely from data that came from before there was a telescope. But telescopes are great things and let's uh, see how they came to be. We generally credit the Italian astronomer Galileo with uh, using a telescope for astronomy for the very first time about 1609 AD. Uh, there was a, a Dutch spectacle maker, an optician basically named Hans Lippershe. And we have reason to think this, uh, this Dutchman uh, actually was the first to hold a couple of lenses up and discovered that it made distant things like a church steeple appear to be a bit closer. But Galileo got the word about that, figured out how to, uh, to replicate Mr. Lippershey's telescope, and in about 1609 he commenced using the telescope. He found the moons of Jupiter, he saw that there were craters on the moon, which was nothing anyone had known about before, he discovered there were spots on the sun. He discovered that Saturn had rings. So the very first telescope uh, gained an awful lot for this, uh, excuse me, for the science of astronomy. This is a replica of two of Galileo's very first telescopes, and this is in a museum in Italy. Well, here's yours truly at a very tender age looking through a telescope of the same design. It's a refracting telescope. This one happened to be at my alma mater uh, in Southern California. But uh, the ref refracting or lens type telescope works like this. We see light entering the tube from right to left. We see a lens of some diameter, maybe four or five or six inches in diameter. The lens causes starlight to begin to come to a focus. And at the other end of the tube, there's a smaller lens called the eyepiece and you look through that and lo and behold, you can see planets, moons, etc., brighter and closer than you can without optical aid. A pair of binoculars and simply two little refracting telescopes. Now it's worth noting in this particular uh, diagram, let me see if I can get my little laser pointer to work. Okay, there it goes. Notice that this lens is actually two lenses. There's a convex, double convex lens at the right hand side and it is right up against a second lens which has a concave surface. These are made of two different kinds of glass and if you do this then chromatic aberration which is an undesired color distortion doesn't occur. Before this kind of double lens uh, was invented uh, chromatic aberration was quite a big problem and I'll show you something fun in just a minute. Here is a very typical refracting telescope of the late 19th, early 20th century. This magnificent instrument is in Flagstaff, Arizona. It has a lens 24 inches in diameter. And with this scope, Percival Lowell, uh, an American literary figure and astronomer, observed the planet Mars for many years, uh, made drawings of it, and uh, they were considered some of the best drawings uh, that anybody had ever made. Going back just to the question of one lens versus two, this is a very early aerial telescope. Look at the thing. The lens is way at upper left, uh, somehow fitted to this open ear tube, and the whole enchilada is suspended on ropes from a tower. I have no idea how people ever aimed the thing. I don't think 
it was very practical. But this was one of the things you could do to reduce chromatic aberration. You just made the tube ridiculously long. Well, that didn't have to last for very long because the double lens design was discovered and it was pretty good, uh, pretty good design. Refracting telescopes culminated uh, with this beautiful instrument. It's in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. It is the 40 inch refracting telescope. No larger lens than 40 inches has ever been made uh, for a refracting telescope. And there's a really good reason because you can only support the lens around its rim, around the perimeter. If you make a lens much larger than 40 inches in diameter, it will sag under its own weight and distort the light waves that are trying to enter the telescope and come to a focus. So 40 inches turned out to be about as far as you could go with the lens type telescope. But fear not, enter this character, Isaac Newton, who, is, who we know about from all kinds of things, the invention of the calculus, the determination of the universal theory of gravitation, uh, lots and lots of discoveries. He had the notion that you could get rid of chromatic aberration by using a parabolic shaped mirror. Here it is over at the left hand side. This is a section of a parabola. And the characteristic of a parabolic, parabolic mirror is that it will bring all wavelengths of light to a common focus. Doesn't matter if it's red light, blue light, yellow light, green light, all of the colors come to a common focus, which they really do not using a simple uh, refracting telescope. So with a Newtonian reflector, uh, you don't have any colored fringes distorting your view of the moon and planets. Notice, by the way, here's a little diagonal mirror that is somehow spent, suspended in the middle of the tube. The reason being, of course, uh, that if you didn't have that, you would put your, your face over here with the eyepiece and the back of your head would block all the incoming light. So Newton realized that he could put a little flat mirror in the middle of the optical tube and that would bounce the converging light rays off to the side of the tube where you could examine them with an eyepiece. So that's the reflecting telescope and all of the biggest telescopes on the planet today uh, and the ones that are in space and going into space are of the reflecting design. This is the biggest uh, reflecting telescope there was on the planet um, for about 50 years. It, so it was built the year I was born, 1949. It's the Hale Telescope on Mount Palomar in Southern California. The tube, which is this vertical member right here, excuse me, houses a curved mirror down at the bottom that is 200 inches in diameter. This telescope is still in service, but light pollution in Southern California uh, is making the astronomers work more and more difficult. Before we go on to the space telescopes, I do want to pay tribute to another kind of telescope, the radio telescope. This one was the biggest in the world for many years. It's on American soil down in the state of in, uh, Puerto Rico, not the state, but in Puerto Rico. And it was huge. Last year, a windstorm brought it down and destroyed it. Uh, and there's still ongoing speculation and wishes being expressed among astronomers that it might be rebuilt. Presently, the largest radio telescope dish on the planet is in the People's Republic of China. Well, just about everybody who's interested in astronomy has been following the career of the amazing Hubble Space Telescope launched at the end of the 1980s. Still going, well, not strong, but it's still going. Uh, it cannot really be serviced anymore, but there is hope that uh, the gyros and electric systems will allow this ast astounding instrument to go on functioning for two or three years more. Well, what comes after that? Well, here's a nice picture of the Hubble in Earth orbit up there at an altitude of about 570 kilometers. That's somewhere between 300 and 400 miles. But what's coming next is this, the James Webb Space Telescope, named for one of the earliest administrators of NASA. It's a funny looking thing. It looks like a giant flower, multi-petaled flower. And that is because it has many mirror segments which work together 
to bring light to a common focus. Those segments, when it's all uh, deployed the way I'm seeing it here, are have a surface area of about, let me see here, six and a half meters in diameter versus the Hubble 2.4 meters in diameter. So the web is going to be launched, believe it or not, the end of this month. The launch date has been stipulated as October 31. So among all of your other plans, carving pumpkins, greeting children at the door, you'll certainly want to be watching NASA Select Television uh, as this instrument gets launched. Here is a comparison uh, of the diameters of the two mirrors. The Hubble primary mirror at left, that's again 2.4 meters in diameter versus the roughly six and a half meter diameter of this lattice work mirror for the James Webb telescope. The telescope will be deployed atop a very large multi-layered solar shield to protect its sensors from the blinding light of the sun. It will be launched from French Guiana uh, on the 31st of October. No definite time had been stipulated as of today when I went to make this uh, PowerPoint, but it's certainly going to be in the news. It's going to be launched on an Ariane rocket from French Guiana. The team at uh, the Webb Telescope headquarters posed for this photograph. Uh, all of the team workers there standing in front of a full-size, 100% scale mock-up of the Webb Telescope. Here's another view of it, deployed and doing its job. This telescope is designed to look at the universe in extremely long wavelengths, infrared wavelengths, which we hope will allow us to solve incredibly interesting problems about the early universe, may help us to discover whether dark matter really exists, and if it does, what, learn new things about it. So anyway, that's the story. Here it is all folded up, ready to be packed uh, and launched in, in just a matter of a couple of weeks. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little lecture, and uh, I will be preparing some other ones for you on some other subjects. So have a very good weekend. Take care.